Hey, hey, welcome back to the channel. Today we're on Project Red Fire, a Gen 5 3 liter Whippled 03 Cobra, turbo 400 swapped, soon to be drag car, street strip drag car. Today's topic is wide bands. We're installing CAN bus wide bands in there, two of them. So you might be thinking, well, what's a CAN based wide band? What's the advantages? How does it work? Well, you're in the right place. We're gonna cover all that today and some more. So first off, I think to explain the advantages of a CAN-based wideband, let's first discuss your more traditional analog-based wideband, and then you'll understand the differences and the advantages once I switch over. So on your typical widebands, you have like you know your Ballinger, AFR 500s, a really good wideband by the way. Uh, it's got a display on there. Uh, you have some that don't have displays. You know Zoetronics, uh, AM, whatever you got. Pretty much all of these work on a similar principle. They output a voltage of zero to five volts most commonly representing what air fuel is on there there's an air fuel displayed on here which can easily be read in the car but you will need it data logged or fed to an ECU depending on your circumstance and that's where it gets tricky so these will have a voltage coming out of them like I said zero to five most common zero volts being maximum rich five volts being maximum lean uh, for simplicity's sake, let's just say that all these widebands work between 10 and 20 air fuel ratio. Let's just make things simpler. Uh, or 0.68 to 1.36 lambda. And uh, take for example, wide open throttle, a very common area on a boosted motor is 0.78 lambda or about 11.44 air fuel ratio. That means this little guy needs to output 0.75 volts to represent that. Think about that, 0.75 volts. You're getting down to the hundredth of a volt accuracy. Then you're asking your data logger, uh, you know, you may have an X4 if you've got an O3 Cobra, or maybe you've got an older X3, same thing. You're asking that device to read that voltage and interpret it. So there's three major things happening here. You're relying on this guy to be able to generate exactly 0.75 volts. You know, no easy task. And then you're asking this thing to be extremely accurate and be able to read exactly 0.75 volts without any error. And the third thing is you're assuming grounding is all perfect because a car's chassis is very noisy and very difficult. So these devices, the data logging device and your wideband should be grounded directly to the battery negative terminal and not touch chassis ground anywhere along the way. But we're sidetracking. Some data logging devices allow for some offset correction due to either ground voltage offsets or other intricacies of trying to measure that voltage to try and offset that difference. That helps. Now you're kind of seeing the downsides of these analog widebands. Then you get something like this, CAN-based wideband. Doesn't look any different. It does have the word CAN bus on it. In fact, they look almost identical except for that little marking. CAN bus is a digital network, but it's simple. There's only two wires. And since it digitally connects to the data logging device or ECU or whatever you're doing, in this case, this car is getting a standalone. And MS3 Pro is going in there. And this supports CAN-based widebands. So what will happen is, your CAN-based wideband is gonna read an air fuel ratio. In that case here, we're talking 11.4 or 0.78 lambda. And it's going to send a digital signal across a digital network, the CAN network, to the ECU and say, I'm reading 11.44 air fuel ratio, or 11.4. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. What's read by the wideband is exactly what the ECU gets told perfectly. There's no error, it's, there's, it's just gone. So that's the huge advantage. The other huge advantage is if something goes wrong, perhaps the, the O2 sensor has failed. Instead of a typical analog wideband just reading maximum rich or maximum lean, whatever it's interpreting, a digital setup on a network like a CAN-based wideband can send a digital signal to the ECU saying, I'm in a fault state, ignore my reading, I have no reading. And the ECU can quit using feedback from that wideband and go into its uh, open loop table, so to speak. So there's another huge advantage. And consider this, an ECU like the MS3 Pro has the ability to do closed loop fueling at wide open throttle. So that means when this car is at maximum boost and maximum RPM, it's taking feedback from those wideband O2 sensors and fine tuning the fueling at wide open throttle. Another advantage with CAN based system is that's gonna be dead accurate. What the wideband is seeing is exactly what the ECU is seeing. 
Okay, so now that you understand that, you're thinking, well, what's the downsides of a CAN-based wideband? Now, unfortunately, the biggest downside is you have to have an ECU or data logging device that supports it. And that's limited. For example, the stock ECU in here does not. You have to have a standalone or some other ECU for that to work. Cost is not really a huge deal. They do cost a little bit more, but not much. Not enough to be an, a, a downside, in my opinion. But compatibility with an ECU obviously is a big deal. But this car is getting an ECU that supports it, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, get to installing them. Now, CAN-based widebands are network devices, which means they each need their own identifying address on the network so that they can separate themselves and you can tell what data is coming from what. It's very simple. Let me show you how this works. Now, I normally do this in the car, but uh, for demonstration purposes, I'm doing it right here on the workbench so I can show you the uh, basic setup and what's going on. So here, I got the laptop out and I got a 12 volt power supply so we can power up the, uh, the wideband. So with the wideband, you'll get a little harness like this and it just plugs in right where it says uh, signal. Super easy. Uh, I simply connected 12 volt and ground over here just to power it up. And then the other cable they give you is this data cable. It has a little, looks like a network plug. Um, I believe it's an RJ11. It's a smaller one like the old, old school phone plugs that you used to have in your house <laughs> years ago. Uh, yeah, dating myself. So, um, and then you have a nine pin serial port right here. It plugs right into the data port, super easy. I can show you the setup over here. Simply just put 12 volts into it to power it up, right on the data port. Data cable comes to the serial port. Then this, is, this cable will be your own cable. It's a simply a uh, USB to serial adapter, which you'll need one of those for a standalone and white boxes and other things anyway. You probably have one laying around or uh, you'll be getting one soon. So let's take a look here. In the software, um, there's really only one thing you have to change. You can go up to this little green icon. And when you open it up, you'll see there is CAN bus ID. So the default is 005A. I changed it to 006A. The CAN bus speed, 500 kilohertz, or kilobits rather here, that's the default and you can leave that alone. That's exactly what you need for the uh, MS3. Now on these units, I went ahead and marked them, driver, and I put a P on that one for passenger. And that's important because you need to know which is which because you're actually using the feedback from these widebands to adjust the fueling on a set of cylinders. In this case, you know, D is gonna be five through eight and passenger will be one, cylinders one through four. And you're going to configure that in your standalone later. I left this one at the default 5A hex address. So really all I've done is I connected this one, gone in the software, changed 5A to 6A, and that's it. Hit OK, save, and you're done. Super simple. Okay guys, I'm going to jump ahead and show you the MS3 portion of the install of the wideband so we have all the configuration in one place and then easy to reference. Right here, we're going to go to CAN bus, and then we're going to go down to CAN receiving. And right here, this is where we're going to make sure we have enable can, receiving CAN data turned on. We're going to, have to set up EGO1, EGO2. Those are defaults. And then under the identifier, this is where you got to reference back. Remember when we were setting up the widebands themselves, we did 5A and 6A. That was in hex. These are in decimal. So as long as you copied me, you can do these same numbers. If you don't know how to convert hex to decimal and you use different numbers, just use Google. It'll translate it for you. Set this to B2U, both of them, multiplier 10, and then leave the rest defaults, 1 and 0. That takes care of that screen. Next, go under here, under EGO control, under fuel settings. EGO sensor type, we're going to set that to wideband. We're going to set our number of sensors to 2. And then right here for EGO ports 1 and 2, we're going to set CAN EGO. And it's not 1 and 2, they're both the same exact option. The differentiation between these two was set up on the previous screen we were just on. This is the portion here where you tell the software which cylinders correlate to which wideband. And this goes by the injectors, so we're going to go with A through H since we're on an 8-cylinder engine. Now this is not simply cylinders 1, 2, 3, 4. This actually goes in the firing order of the engine. So we've got you know, 1, 3, 7, 2, 6, 5, 4, 8 for this engine. And that's how you correlate these across. Uh, passengers was our EGO2, drivers was EGO1. Now if you're confused about, you know, do these correlate correctly to your firing order and you just want to double check that, you can go over here to the uh, engine and sequential settings and it's right here, firing order, this is where you set it up, or you should have previously, A through H and what cylinders they correspond to. 
All right, that's it. Now you should have the uh, CAN data wideband feeding into the ECU. Okay, we're gonna end off part one over there. Hopefully you understand how the CAN bus widebands work and why I chose them. Next time, part two, we'll go ahead and make, actually install them in the car, get the wiring done, and should be prepped for our MS3 standalone install. See you next time.